opportunity to silence your cell phones. I have a rule, if your phone rings during one of my lectures, I get to answer. <laughs> I'm Don Morris. I'm the, a member of the executive committee of the Jackson County Democrats. The Jackson Democrats believe that today's highly polarized environment has made science increasingly marginalized and misrepresented. The trend is very troubling at a time when our democracy is, has, uh, is demands, actually demands, evidence-based solutions not wishful thinking or special interest meddling. It is in this spirit that we sponsor this nonpartisan educational forum. It is in this many groups ranging from right to left, including the Democrats and the Republicans, have their share of non-evidenced beliefs in the area of GMOs and other things. Tonight's program is intended to help us develop a better understanding of the science involved. It is hoped that we all will leave tonight's discussion better prepared to make informed decisions on the application of GMOs to agriculture and related areas. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Michael Torgerson. And you've got a hint of his capabilities if his introductory remarks about cell phones. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Torgus and I will be moderating this evening's debate. For 16 years I've been teaching political science, economics, and business ethics at Rogue Community College. The format for this evening is as follows. Each of our panelists will give their remarks, followed by a question and answer period at the end. Questions may be submitted in writing on the cards you received at the welcome tables. We have volunteers around the room who will be able to collect your questions and bring them to me. If your question is for a specific panelist, please indicate that on the card. We do this for two reasons. One, it helps things flow better, and two, it keeps it so that people are asking questions, not making speeches. <laughs> Tonight's session is scheduled to end around 8.30, and being respectful of our panelists' time, we will get started. First this evening is Dr. Ray Seidler, formerly a professor of microbiology at Oregon State University, and most recently a senior research microbiologist in the terrestrial plant ecology branch of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Ray is the author of two documents that describe the initial research needed for regulating the seed industry that wanted to release GMOs into the environment. He and his research team conducted extensive research directly related to GMO biosafety and agriculture. He is listed in the 2000 Outstanding World Scientist of the 20th Century at the Biographical Center of Cambridge, England. He's authored 150 scientific articles and co-authored three books. He earned his PhD at the U University of California, Davis, and has studied at several universities, including U Texas at Houston, U Maryland at College Park, and U Maryland Medical School in Baltimore. He has lectured on GMO biosafety throughout the United States, Europe, and most recently in Central America. Please welcome Dr. Ray Seidel. Hi, good evening, everybody. Oh, let me get uh, another piece of equipment turned on here and do a little sound test. Wow. How about that? A little bit better. Good. Thanks for turning out this evening. Uh, limited time, a lot of slides. We're going to fly and uh, no more monkey business. Let's get right to the presentation. But before we start, I want to set one scene for you. I want you to be thinking about when I start that you're looking and learning things from a textbook. First part of the presentation. Second part of the presentation, I want you to imagine that you are in a laboratory setting where some genetically engineered something or others are being made. And in the third and last part of the presentation, I want you to imagine that you participated in some field work uh, where you've helped to monitor and to measure the production 
of genetically modified organisms, and you've looked into herbicide usage. So that when you walk away tonight, there will be a test. And I'm just kidding. Focus. Ah, thank you, Don. Okay. So the textbook stuff. Uh, GMOs, aka also known as recombinant organisms, genetically modified organisms, genetically engineered organisms, transgenic organisms, all the same thing. They involve all life forms that we know on the planet and viruses. Everything is involved in being genetically modified for business. So, what the heck is the big deal? Everything is involved. Well, part of the big deal is how do you get a piece of the DNA from an Arctic flounder into a California tomato and still preserve the texture and the flavor of that tomato? And the reason why we would do that, the flounder lives uh, happily in temperatures below zero. We might want to protect the tomato from uh, frost. Uh, from frosting. Well, uh, it's a very complicated process that molecular biologists tried to do many years ago, were, but were not too successful. And the reason I think they weren't too successful is because they're only molecular biologists, they're not ecologists as well. And it's not a matter of one simple gene that's going to change uh, that tomato into all of those characteristics. What are we talking about again with GMOs? They are life forms that are changed through gene slicing techniques of genetic engineering. Uh, the process merges genes from different species, usually at least different genera, at least, well, sometimes maybe even different phyla of organisms, bacteria to plants, uh, fungi to plants, etc. all of those combinations that you can understand. And, uh, I want to emphasize that what you will see in a moment are processes that take place that have never taken place naturally since the beginning of this earth. There are no combinations of natural occurrences of what we'll see from traditional breeding, which is very different compared to genetic engineering. So let's start out. We still have our nose in the textbook. Uh, how do we make recombinant DNA, and then how do we make a genetically modified organism? By the way, do, does anyone here know how to make a genetically modified organism in the laboratory? That's great. <laughs> now I can tell you. Okay, everything is about genes. What the heck is a gene? A gene is a piece of DNA that encodes the information to make a protein. And let's say that there are two classes of proteins, a structural class of protein and an enzyme class of proteins. Enzymes are catalysts found in the cells of all living material, and their function is to speed up reactions, to generate energy, to allow the cells to metabolize and be good. In a multicellular organism, energy helps us run, walk, breathe, heartbeat, etc. One function of the enzyme. Another function is to synthesize the building blocks of the chemicals that are needed by the cell. On the other hand, a structural protein is very different. It just sits and doesn't do much. And if you are a protein uh, from an organism called bacillus, and that protein could be an insecticide that will kill certain classes of insects that eats the protein that forms a crystal inside the bacterium or in a inside a genetically modified organism. So structural proteins just sit and do things, keep things together or kill insects. Enzymes are involved in reactions. That is part of the definition of what a gene is. So in genetic engineering, we move genes around. Uh, for example, what I have pictured here as a single gene, uh, you might be curious, well, how many genes does it take to make a living organism? And it takes anywhere from 350 to 2,000, approximately, to make a bacteria. So we're talking about moving a single gene, for the most part. 
Speaking of bacteria, I want to emphasize the importance of what the genetic composition is in bacteria. A chromosome, and it's almost always just one, and it has 350 or two, up to 2,000 genes. But there is another very important class of genetic material in many, many bacteria, and those are called DNA plasmids. And those plasmids carry anything like 10, maybe up to around 50 genes. And those plasmids are loved by the biotechnology industry. They are put to work to move the genes that we need to move around to make a genetically modified organism. These little structures, these little circles are very dense, very small, and they're easy to isolate and manipulate in the laboratory. Another reason why scientists like to play with them. Okay, we'll get to the pointer. Put on your laboratory coats, and those are the white things that are on the back uh, room over there that maybe you missed on the way in. So we're going to talk a little bit about manipulating genes and how this is done. Focus, please, on the top right part of this slide. And we will have, or we do have, some little small circular circles that I showed you are DNA plasmids that have been isolated from a very unusual, very important bacterium called agrobacterium. And it is the only bacterium known that is possible to transmit some of its genetic information into the chromosomes of a plant. And if you will, a bacterium having sex with a plant, literally transferring some genes. Very important in the biotechnology business. On the left, I'd like to call your attention to an organism uh, or part of the chromosome from something called Bacillus thuringiensis. You may know it as BT. You can buy it in the local hardware store, spray it on your plants, and it kills some larval forms of insects. So we've broken that Bacillus open. We've isolated pieces of the chromosome. And our end result, where we're going with this, is to make a hybrid or a recombinant DNA molecule by taking a piece of the plasmid DNA from agrobacteria and integrating into that little circle the green gene that I've diagrammed up here uh, on the slide. This green gene happens to make the protein that is a structural protein that is the insect uh, toxin. So we are now going to take the isolated DNA plasmid circles and pieces of the chromosome from bacillus and expose it to an enzyme that many of us call the scissors enzyme. And this scissors, as the name implies, cuts open the plasmid, and we want it to cut open in one place, and makes the tips of each one of those ends on that plasmid sticky. It's like a little glue there. And we'll do the same thing with the chromosome until we get uh, a solution of pretty much pure pieces of the green gene which codes for that insect toxin. We'll put both together inside the same test tube, add a little salt, warm it up, and our little pieces that are like this, when you warm it up, go and they just come back together because the glue makes them stick. And I mean it's rapid process, it's efficient process, and then some of those combinations, when they snap back together, produces a hybrid molecule. Part of the green gene, as we have illustrated, combines with a part of the red uh, plasmid DNA, producing, thank you, you've just made a recombinant DNA molecule, a piece from a bacillus bacterium and a piece from an agrobacterium. Now we're going to put that hybrid molecule back into a bacterium, agrobacterium, uh, as indicated here on the lower part of the slide. And all you need to do is put some living agrobacterium into that saline solution. Some of those cells take up the hybrid plasmid, grow this bacterium in the laboratory, and you have now your first genetically modified organism. Let's take it one step later, uh, one step further, and make a genetically modified plant from that hybrid DNA molecule. And there are two ways that are characteristic 
of what the biotechnology uh, industry likes to do. One is the biological procedure on the left top part of the slide, and the other is a physical procedure on the right side. They're independent procedures. On the left side, we start with the bacteria and agrobacteria that I've shown you on the previous slide with the hybrid DNA molecule. And because of the magic of that bacterium, if you blend up some plant tissue, put individual cells on gel in a nutrient dish, as we've indicated here, and you put a couple of drops of that bacteria that cozies up through those plant cells and shoots a piece of that DNA plasmid through the plant cell wall, through the cytoplasm of the plant cell, and into the nucleus. And a piece of that DNA can combine in with a piece of genetic material of the plant. Forever, it makes a stable hybrid chromosome in the plant cell. That's the biological mechanism. If you don't want to do that or you're having trouble for one technical reason or another, you can use what scientists call a gene gun. You take not the bacterium, but the naked hybrid DNA plasmid molecules, mix them with some tungsten metal micro beads and just blast it under air pressure through the cell wall of a plant cell. And in a few cases, the little micro holes that come into the wall of the cell carry with it the hybrid molecule. It enters again the nucleus of the plant cell, recombines with some of the chromosome, and voila, you now have a recombinant or a GMO single plant cell. <coughs> Another miracle of life is that from that single plant cell can be regenerated an entire plant. So those plant cells are put on nutrients, incubated, and with time, a mini plant will appear with first the leaves, and then minuscule roots. And when the roots appear, you can transplant that little booger into soil, <laughs> let it grow out to be a full-size plant. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you know that you have generated a genetically modified plant. And that could be, just let your imagination go, corn plant, soybean plant, cotton plant, etc., etc. So that simply is how a GMO is made. It's not anymore. It's not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward using these very standardized techniques. Ray, could I do this in my tool shed? Uh, we're in a laboratory right now, Chris, so uh, uh, I don't know about, I haven't visited your tool shed, so I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> But the laboratory we were working in is clean, it is well lit, it's temperature controlled, it's pretty much free of other germs. Uh, it has some strange looking boxes on the counters that regulate the temperature of your DNA solutions and so on. So if you have that in your tool shed, the answer is yes. <laughs> In 17 to 20 years since this process has been going on that I just described, we've had commercial GMOs. And during that time, we went from zero crop to about 100, or I'm sorry, more than a couple of hundred million acres worldwide. Can you imagine, can you just picture that? A couple of hundred million acres. And over 90% of what is available in the general supermarkets in the United States reflects that our acreage is about 90% more or less of genetically modified plant material and grown. So with that kind of burden out in the environment, we must ask the question, hey, we, we monitored this. When I worked many years ago for EPA, we wrote up the methods of how to monitor, what kind of problems to look for, all of 
public research that's been done by our labs and Corvallis and other places around the world. Is the monitoring system working? Yes, when it is done. Is the regulatory system working? Mm, not well, because all the powers that be, including many university scientists, say these things are safe. So it's like a closed loop that feeds back. If they're safe, why monitor? Well, that's why we didn't monitor, folks, because they're safe. And I don't mean to be tongue-in-cheek. This is factual information. People are not dropping dead in our streets from 20 years of consuming GMOs. But what about the ecological side? You can tell I'm an ecologist. That might be a different story. About 10 years ago, my former colleagues at the EPA laboratory up the road in Corvallis published a paper that is what I like to call a watershed research report that showed what was going on with regards to pollen spread in central Oregon in the Madras area. There was an experimental plot, about 160 acres, planted to a type of grass that was under experimentation destined for golf courses. And my former colleagues, I'm retired, so their former colleagues, uh, did one heck of a research job to ask the question, is this pollen going to spread? In the 1980s, when I was working, we thought pollen, pollen spread 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet. The results of Dr. Watford's study involved placing literally thousands of small pots of grass out in the field up to 12 miles away from the test plant. Can you just imagine setting things out 8 miles, 10 miles, 12 miles, 14 miles, 16 miles, a lot of work. They processed thousands of samples to ask the question, did any pollen go out to this potted grass seed that I put out 10 miles off the experimental plot? And the answer is yes. In every place there is a red dot on this graph was a hit of an event in which genetically engineered Roundup Ready, that is glyphosate resistant, grass, pollen, any of that genetic molecule, it drifted out 10 miles, 12, up to 12 miles they detected. And it wasn't really supposed to leave the plot. Is this over? No. Come on. Let's go. Uh, last year, another professor at Ohio State University, a very reputable, very good at the pinnacle of her field, Dr. Allison Snow, came out, interviewed people, and published this paper. Part of the title is Illegal Gene Flow from Transgenic Creeping Bent Grass. The saga continues, and it could be in Central Oregon, but they didn't say that but it's what it's all about, simply meaning that the escape of the pollen produced uh, hybrid weeds, and those hybrid weeds are still there, and they're reproducing and spreading out their pollen to other hybrid weeds, not of related species, but now even into a new genus, all of which are Roundup resistant. Not a, not a good thing. And this is a worldwide thing that's going on, and it's been known for about 12 years. Here's a picture, thanks to Greenpeace, of farmers in Spain burning their corn, their organically grown corn crop, Chris, because it had cross-pollinated with GM corn grown nearby. Okay, we're out in the field. We're getting close to my presentation. Uh, finish of my presentation, and we're going to do some interviews now as to the benefits or lack thereof of using genetically engineered microorganisms, and we're our genetically modified plants, sorry. We're going to go to Wisconsin, we're going to go to Iowa, and we're going to go to Illinois, and we're going to look at some data published by the extension services of the respective universities in those states. First up, Wisconsin, and we're talking about corn. And it's a 10-year study 
Uh, there are 12 types of GMO varieties that were used. You can't see the numbers, don't worry about it, just look at the colors. For example, the non-GMOs, nearly 20,000 observations over 10 years, the yield was 186 bushels of corn per acre. And the question is, how well did the various types of GM corn behave? There are 12 varieties. Three varieties of GMO corn behave better, produce higher yields than the non-GMO. Three varieties of GMO corn did not. And those were st statistically tested and validated results. Three better, three not better. And the remaining six in white were a draw. Not possible to say whether one was better than another. Okay, Wisconsin. Let's go over to the Corn Belt area in Iowa. Oh, I'm sorry, Ohio. And for two years, in those tests, there were 19 varieties, 16 GMO, and only three non-GMO. Very quickly, no differences in the yield, no mathematically statistical differences. But look at this. Six GMO varieties did better than the non-GMO, but 10 GMO varieties did more poorly. So 10 out of 16, or 16%, 16 did not give the farmers the yield that the non-GMOs did, but the farmers were unfortunate enough to have to buy and pay extra for those GMO seeds. <coughs> Uh, same analogous stuff for soybean. We're now in Illinois. The blue line is the yield of soybeans over 10 years, no change. The red is the increasing cost for the soybean seed. A 300% uh, increase in about 10 years. Geez, guess who paid for that? Uh, last slide that I'll show you tonight is farmers thought they were better off because they'd use less Roundup, less glyphosate, less herbicide. Okay, I think you can see the blue arrow here as I wind down the top. Uh, that's pointing to the year of 1996. The year, the first release of commercial Roundup resistant soy. The blue curve is the amount and thousands of tons of glyphosate that has been added mm. to the American agricultural ecosystem since 1996, about a 15-fold increase. In other language, that is a 1,500% increase in the use of Roundup. Okay, the last slide, with comparable crop yields, elevated herbicide usage, potential cross-pollination to non-GMO crops, occurrences of super weeds, Export economic issues, can someone tell me why our farmers continue to use GMO seeds? I really don't understand. No spin there. I don't understand. Thanks for your attention. Next up, Dr. Robin Miller is a prominent practicing physician and TV personality here in the Rogue Valley. She's a medical reporter for NBC's channel KOBI5, sorry Stephen, and producer of the award-winning series Is There a Doctor in the House, shown on the patient channel nationwide. Co-author of the highly rated book The Smart Woman's Guide to Midlife and Beyond, Dr. Miller holds medical degrees from U Illinois and the John Hopkins School of Public Health. She's been on the faculty of the State University of New York, as well as the U of O, and authors papers in medical journals on her research on heart disease and women. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robin Miller.
of stomach problems in 206, by uh, up to 267 percent when compared to those pigs that got non-GMO feed. In male pigs, it was up 400 percent. So there have been multiple studies on animals with GMO feed, um, and they found tumors, infertility, premature death, all kinds of terrible things going on in these animals. Workers that have worked in genetically modified cotton fields have reported skin, eye, and upper rep respiratory tract allergies. Some have required hospitalization. One doctor treated over 255 workers from cotton fields. Sheep have been given genetically modified, or gone grazing in genetically modified cotton fields in India. And they found that they became incredibly sick. Of those sheep that were grazing around in the fields, 25% died within a week. And they did post-mortem exams on those sheep, and it was from a toxic reaction. In England, in 1999, when genetically modified soy was introduced, Soy allergies jumped from 10 to 15 percent in just one year in 1999. So, other, re other reactions that were occurring we don't know. We know that asthma has been on the rise since the late 1980s, early 1990s. Is it genetically modified food? I don't know. Some people theorize it's fast food, but how many fast food companies are using genetically modified foods? I don't know. There's no good way to sort all this out. So, you know, when drugs are tested, it starts with animal research. If genetically modified foods were a drug, they would never make it to market because of all the animal studies that have been done. Unfortunately, we are the guinea pigs. And we are being guinea pigs without our informed consent. And that is just plain wrong, in my opinion. no idea what we're being exposed to, what our children are being exposed to. It's horrifying. So it, to summarize, and I, didn't, I don't have that much to say because there just isn't that much out there, and that is a lot to say in and of itself because no one's really able to look at this. They're getting obstructed in, ter in terms of doing human studies. But I look at this as Pandora's box. And unfortunately, once this is all released, it's almost impossible to put it back because these organisms, genetically modified organisms, are getting incorporated in our bodies. They say that the stomach kills everything before it gets to our colon and our intestines, but it doesn't. We found that it doesn't. So it's being incorporated into our bodies, into our GI tract. I've seen so many people with GI problems, bacterial overgrowth, celiac. How do we know that the increase in all this isn't due to genetically modified foods? We don't. But I think it's time we find out. Yes. And in the meantime, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to think about it at all? Because it's just not here. Yes. So, end of discussion. <laughs> Once again, if you have questions for our panelists, the cards are on the back table, and we have volunteers going around to pick them up. Next up, Chris Hardy. Farms 10 acres of certified organic vegetables, perennials, and seed production. He's been active working with farming communities internationally, and as a farmer, is active in promoting permaculture education and the local food movement. Chris Hardy. Um, I'm Chris Hardy, local farmer, um, and very concerned about our food supply here in the Rogue Valley. Um, uh, boy, I guess it was about February of last year, of 2012, that um, our farm was looking for a piece of land. And uh, just so happened that the land owner that uh, was a friend of our friend that we went to check in with to see what the possibilities were to lease this piece of land, was, which was right in the city limits virtually, of Ashland, right uh, behind the John Muir Ashland Middle School, right, right back in that, uh, in a field right behind the, the, right there on Normal Avenue. 
And some of you may have seen the, the report, incidentally, just uh, uh, here a few days ago uh, on the news from uh, from the genetically engineered sugar beets that were allegedly destroyed. Uh, that was the same field. And so we're having this conversation with this, uh, this landowner, and, and lo and behold, uh, we walk over to the other side of the property and find out that there are uh, these sugar beets that are being grown there by Syngenta Corporation. And having traveled to all these places in the world, uh, India being one of them, Pakistan, uh, uh, Syngenta, like, is just kind of a commonplace name in, uh, in agriculture there. Um, they've really made their way into the, the farming communities, uh, you know, one of the largest farming communities on the planet, the Indus River Valley. Um, and uh, so this, this kind of led to further discussion, further research with uh, fellow farmers um, uh, and Syngenta to find out that indeed those were genetically engineered crops. And they had been there for a number of years growing these crops. And so here we are with our seeds down on Siskiyou Boulevard at, a, uh, at our site that we had been for five years growing uh, charred seed which is the same family as the GMO sugar beet. It's a Roundup Ready sugar beet that, that you know, is the GM crop Syngenta is here in the Rogue Valley growing. And so I'm thinking like, oh my God, can this be possible that our chard being about a quarter of a mile away and not more than a half a mile away on the other Syngenta plot, uh, Tolman Creek Road is where their other plot was right there. We were virtually surrounded by genetically engineered crops. And here at the time, understand that they were regulated by the USDA under the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service under APHIS uh, to keep a four mile distance from another seed grower and here they were right there next to us as a certified naturally grown farm that we were at the time and having other conversations with other, other farmers lo and behold they're across the street or oh this person was uh, you know a proposition by Syngenta to just uh, buy them out and it, like we'll just take your whole seed crop and 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 you know then you don't have to worry we'll just pay for it and so anyhow this led to bringing bring in uh, putting the call out to bring people together to see what to do about this in our community and uh, uh, about 75 people showed up and we all came together to uh, uh, create uh, what is now um, measure 15-119 through citizens initiative and uh, bring people together is, is going to ban the genetically engineered crops in Jackson County and this is this is uh, as a farmer um, and understanding a little bit about the biology of how plants work and pollen flow you don't stop that stuff you know it just it, it, as, a, as a farmer mentor of mine seed veteran seed grower he's been growing seeds for almost three decades said he's like that's that's like the fish up. You put that in there, it's like the bar. You don't just pull that back out. It's in there for good. So, you know, Monsanto technology, like Syngenta technology, like this stuff is just sinking in here, is, is we're moving ahead. And so called uh, USDA APHIS, um, and they sent an investigator out. They said, there's really nothing we could do. We could send an investigator out. So the investigators, two of them came out. And um, uh, this was, I believe, it was right after the deregulation of the sugar bee was like, it was right about the time. Yeah, right about the same time, I think, I never can't remember. J July, anyhow, 2012, it, uh, the GM sugar beet, the Roundup Ready sugar beet, was fully deregulated by the USDA. And so you can grow, at that point, you could grow it anywhere in the United States. No problem. So this was all happening as we're like, holy cow, what the heck? They were growing them right in our backyard for a number of years. And no one really knew that they were right across the street or just up the road or whatever. And so once this hit the news splash, these farms were contacted subsequently. And again, the money was coming out and they were telling us, hey, we'll just buy your seeds from you. Um, uh, for you. We'll buy your seeds for you. What's your favorite seed company? Is it Peaceful Valley? Is it Territorial Seed Company? Uh, you know, and then you won't have to save your seeds. Uh, you know, does that work for you? And it's just like, whoa, no, hold on. We've been saving our seeds since the inception of, of Village Farm. And Village Farm, that's like part of our farm. So the, uh, you know, the ODA was contacted. Uh, Oregon Till certifier, our, our, our you know, a certifier at the time uh, on our other site. We were certified naturally grown on that one site. 
certified organic on another site that was a little further south of Ashland, but still possibly within that four mile distance that, that Syngenta uh, or any other biotech regulated crop was supposed to keep uh, for the, the sugar beet. So um, anyhow, that uh, basically warranted like people throwing up their hands saying, you know, there's nothing we can do. We don't currently require any testing and so you're kind of on your own, like it's, it's getting deregulated in a few weeks and you know, so there's nothing really we can do for you and Oregon Tilt was like, you know, the whole certification thing really didn't warrant anything. Um, and so anyhow, moving ahead, I uh, had conversations with farmers, um, our team uh, connected with business owners across the Rogue Valley and within uh, a number of months we had um, uh, nearly 300 uh, businesses and farms, over 100 farms have now signed on. That list has grown to nearly 400 plus at this point of businesses, nonprofits, uh, uh, and and farm and food in restaurants and people who are food processors. These people have signed on and support saying they see a rogue valley without the genetically engineered crops. And they are behind it. Yeah. So um, our outreach continued moving forward. We uh, uh, brought Jeffrey Smith into town, who's this just amazing guy who's been working on the genetically engineered food supply for about 15, 20 years, like virtually his whole life. He's dedicated to bringing truth and light to, uh, to these GE crops. Um, we, we played a role in the Rogue Valley Food Summit and attended that um, and subsequently submitted a proposal to those who are holding the peace for the Rogue Valley Food Systems a, a security, Food Security Systems Plan. Uh, moving forward, as Josephine has also such thing, Jackson County, as of this last fall, has created that. So um, the proposal was that we work seed security into our food security as a very vital piece for any of us to even sit here and talk about what is the future of our food supply. So, um, and we continue to have weekly tablings at growers markets and uh, uh, connecting with farmers and outreach throughout. Um, and on our Facebook at this point, since January, we, we are now uh, anywhere every week in a one week period, we um, have anywhere from about three quarters of a million to up to, we've hit, hit here a couple weeks back, 2.7 million views of GMO Free Jackson County Facebook page. So if you haven't liked our Facebook page, get on that one. So we to stay in touch. So we worked uh, the political angles, uh, touching in with Peter Buckley's office, um, working with Center for Food Safety, George Kimbrell, and putting uh, model legislation together, which is now before the legislation up in Salem, um, on a number of different issues uh, to basically to, to help out our farmers here to keep control of the food supply uh, into the hands of our local farmers, not the seed control up in Salem. Um, and basically, uh, oh, and th then we met with Representative Hicks here a couple weeks ago to talk about Senate Bill 633 moving ahead, uh, again, which is one of those bills that would uh, rest control of the seed supply from our farmers here in Jackson County, Josephine County, Benton County, Multnomah uh, and, and the like. So this is a really important issue and Representative Hicks seems like he he understands that, uh, shared also with him, that uh, uh, the coexistence is not going to work for us here in the Rogue Valley, uh, that we are not the Willamette Valley, and even pulled out a map and showed Representative Hicks, uh, Jackson County, uh, the Rogue Valley, Josephine County, is this little thread on this map, this little hairline fracture on this map. And then you look at the Willamette Valley, and it's this big, huge, like, opening up into Portland type of a funnel type thing. You know, it's like, right, so, you know, we're really comparing apples to oranges here when it comes to uh, looking at a management plan for our agriculture and our food, uh, our seed system here in the Rogue Valley. And another point that we shared was that uh, foreign multinational corporations um, are, are essentially interfering in our regional uh, uh, issues, yeah. and this just this just doesn't fly, folks. This is it's just it's not going to work. It doesn't work for it doesn't work for our farmers. I mean, I, 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 Switzerland, you know, Basel, Switzerland. Anybody know where Basel, Switzerland is? Like, yeah. imagine if Basel, Switzerland has you know makes the decisions for what we put in our mouths every day. Yeah. 
Um, so subsequently, we uh, 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 the farmers came together to develop the Southern Oregon Sea Growers Association. We just met a couple nights ago and formally uh, passed um, uh, by consensus. We now have bylaws that are official. We are up and running, folks, and moving forward with uh, our farmers here for our local seed system for Josephine and Jackson County to make up uh, uh, Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association. Um, so, in incidentally, um, this took about a half a dozen meetings leading up over, over several months. We've been meeting since January. This meeting was called um, because Syngenta Corporation had thought it was the right thing to do to go to the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Growers Association and ask for incorporation of Jackson and Josephine County to be incorporated into the system of the Willamette Valley pinning system. Again, the difference here is to understand that there are large corporations that s s are seated at the table for the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association. Whereas these 40 plus farmers that are involved that have been put out through the Farm Bureau, put out through uh, OSU Extension Office has helped support this all along the way. These 40 plus growers, I'm sure many of you in this room know these these farmers, these are the people that you see every week at the growers market. So that's the difference between Willamette Valley Agricultural System and Rogue Valley Agricultural System is that they are not the same. And essentially, uh, through this process of 40 plus farmers, we had one biotech corporation who showed up at that at, at this recent, uh, not two days ago, but uh, three weeks previous, saying, essentially, we are here to tell all you farmers that what Syngenta and all these farmers have come forward to create, they are going to have to back out and rethink this and essentially it doesn't, the way it's set up is not going to work for their business model. So essentially folks, that's where, where we are at right now. Coexistence has failed in the Rogue Valley as far as GMOs. So anyhow, our, our micro, our highly diversified um, organic farmers and farm systems here in the Rogue Valley uh, are, are not the same as, as the Willamette Valley and the coexistence. I can say this firsthand, that coexistence does not work. And I can tell you this right now, because our farm has lost this spring, not including what we understand to be contaminated crops that essentially we have had to toss because we are so close to these, these uh, GMO plots. But this spring, I had to call Fedco, the largest cooperative seed company in the United States, and essentially explain to them that we had GMOs, that even Syngenta said that we're too close and this ain't going to work out. And after Syngenta told all the farmers that they're in it to work together. Syngenta has a track record of always working together and getting along, right? You heard of that one before? They told, they, you know, number, number, we've had a number of meetings with the commissioners, with Don Skendrick, and, and, and coexistence. And, and Don, uh, Don's like, so you guys just gonna, you know, there's no reason why you can't just work this out, right? You know, so here I am like, right, that they, Syngenta told us at the seed grower meeting. And then Syngenta says, after one of those meetings here a few weeks ago, Oh no, we cannot pull our sugar beets off of Valley View, Talent, Ashland, neck of the woods. We cannot pull, pull those are going in the ground. I said, well that's going to directly uh, infringe upon our right, on our only plot at that point, where our sugar, uh, where our chard was planted, going to seed, going to flower, that these GMOs are also being planted within that four mile distance. So basically, our, our seed uh, purchaser turned us down. This is a contract that our farm has had to plan, months and months of planning, to pull this together to get these crops to where they are. And we have essentially uh, pulled these crops up and had to compost them. This is a $1,000 loss to our farm. Economic sabotage. Economic sabotage, that's right. So anyhow, um, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that, um, that, that our local food security 
again, begins with the seed. And it's really important that we take care of that, folks. And I don't know if you've been following the issue with the canola up in the Willamette. The canola up there, that's got a lot of friends. You heard from Ray earlier about how the genetics, just, they kind of go. They just kind of, they move. We've heard it from Dr. Carol Mallory Smith, who we had down at OSU Extension, wheat scientist. Gene flow, pollen flow, not going to stop it. That's just common nature. She just like re has have reiterated that over over the months leading up to what is going to happen with the canola. So the canola would impact our kale, our broccoli, our cabbage. Uh, you know the list the list goes on and on. So you know if canola ends up here in the Rogue Valley, you know it's it's I don't know if you like green leafy vegetables or any of those cruciferae that they say are so good for you to protect from cancer, as Bonnie as Bonnie knows or Bonnie Robin. So, um, so that it's just vitally important that we protect that, and uh, uh, we, we do not want to jeopardize our future here with, with nearly 90%, as Ray shared, 90% of our food supply, up to 90% of our food supply being genetically engineered. Um, uh, that's not food, folks, honestly. Like, the, the packaged, processed, genetically engineered crap that they're cranking out and putting in these boxes, so you know, so we, we need to, we we need to think about what we are going to do about that. That is about us, our our lifestyle, our convenience, the process of it. Really, we we each have to sit with that and figure out right. Okay, less on the GMO or less on the processed foods, or, and what do we have left? We have fresh leafy greens. We have carrots and roots and all kinds of vegetables, uh, you know, the list goes on and on of herbs and amazing things that we can grow here in the Rogue Valley. So that is, is where, where we, we are going here. The loss of our biodiversity cannot be ignored any further. Monocrops, don't cut it. They do not support our pollinators. They are not, uh, monocrops do not lead to a healthy us, to a healthy future, to a healthy children. So this is vitally important that we consider the seed and I thank you all so much. And finally, Brian Combs is a retired IT project manager who now lives in Ashland, but has been visiting here off and on for 20 years, so somehow he got through the gate. He, along with Chris Hardy, are the chief petitioners and co-authors of Measure 15-119, Brian Combs. Like this. Let me get my slide show you on. Um, interestingly enough, the president and CEO of Syngenta, you know, Switzerland, has a ban on GMO. You can't buy them or grow them right. in uh, Switzerland. And the president of Syngenta was asked, well, what do you think about that? And this is a great answer. He said, well, look, uh, here in Switzerland, two things are real important to us, tourism and food. And those are important to you, and a GM ban is probably appropriate. Think of moderate. So he dumps and dumps it at once. That's the Southern, uh, Southern Oregon Hicks get all this stuff. Louder. Anyway, um, let me get my slideshow to right? Oh, well, I'm doing that too. How many people here signed a petition to put 15119 on the ballot? Okay, well, good. Everybody give yourself a round of applause. Okay, we have 7,000. No, no, no. Uh, does that work better? Yeah. yeah. I'll try it again, okay? The science part of this, is we figure it'd be about 45,000 votes in the May 2014 election. So we need to get 25,000 yeses. I got 7,000 on the petition drive. You have some friends and stuff, but I want every one of you to pledge to meet with your neighbors, meet with your schools, meet with your church groups, and ask them to have us come and give this kind of presentation. We need 25,000 yes votes, or we're going to lose. So let's, that's the math in front of us. Now I'm going to try and get my slideshow going. I'll take this a second, and I'll do my presentation.
talk about Measure 15119 to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Jackson County citizens. What are some of the issues around it and what we're facing and what we got to do? Um, there's a Rogue Valley. Nice pretty pictures, right? Everybody thinks that's what we live. Looks real nice. There might be some clouds on the horizon, however. Okay. In the back of the room, you're going to see a map. And, uh, one of the things I want to point out to you in that map you can look after the show is that this brown area outlined there is the watershed of Bear Creek. It's peak to peak. That's roughly eight miles across. And what the red circles are represent only a dozen organic producers in the Bear Creek Valley with a four-mile circle around them. Whoops, I went too far. <laughs> Hang on a second. The, the issue is, it's like the old Western movie, this valley's not big enough for the both of us, okay? It's a tight fit, it's windy, it's tight, you, it's four, that's four mile boundaries for one crop. Some crops require 10, 12 mile boundaries. The coexistence really is difficult, even apart from the political issues of trying to make it happen. Um, now it's going the other way. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, GMO testing is big in Oregon. Most people don't know that in 2011 there were 664 permits issued by USDA to do GMO testing in the state of Oregon and four farmers in the United States. Okay, it's just not a kind of, you know, and what, what, what the wheat gets out, how many million dollars a wheat grower is going to lose because of GMA in Japan and South Korea accounts that are tra contracts for some, what's alleged to be wild card wheat. Ten years ago they stopped the testing and it's still here. Hundreds of millions of dollars down the rat hole because of this stuff. But anyway, we're the fourth largest in the United States. Uh, and what's genetically modified? Take a look at that picture from USDA. You eat some of that stuff? Not all, not all of it's commercially available. The point is, it's not just cotton, canola, corn, and soy. They got your whole dinner table on Atari. All right? And it's also, it's intellectual property disguised as food. All right? You know, this. They own the genes in this. Dole Pineapple wants to make a pink pineapple. GMO based. They're trying to get a permit for it. Does the pineapple taste better? No. Sweeter? No. It's pink. What's also nice about it, it happens to belong to Dole Pineapple. They own the DNA and can force people to, in effect, do it. Let me go back. Okay, so it's intellectual property disguised as food. So, what we do about it, we run an ordinance. Okay, the ordinance is very, very simple. Says you can't grow a crop here in uh, Jackson County. All right. Um, it's also got more to it. It's got definitions of what it is, exceptions for medical and scientific research. Keep in mind if you're a Genentech or a biotech firm and want to open and build jobs here, as long as you do it in the laboratory, this, 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 because it doesn't affect farmers, the ban doesn't affect you, so it won't stop jobs. It also uh, uses existing law. If you look at the Jackson County Code, section 630, you'll find a control district for getting rid of diseased pear trees and a process to enforce it. We just copied that, put it in a section 635, called it Measure 15119. So you're voting for the same law we already have. A little different focus, but it's basically the same law. It's existing county law using existing county staff and things like that. Um, what it doesn't do, it's important. You get a lot of myths about this thing. Um, uh, let's read with this. It doesn't require. It doesn't ban GMO products in stores. No labeling. It doesn't affect beer and wine production. Yeast is not a plant. Doesn't affect animals. Um, doesn't create bureaucracy. Doesn't have the county budget. And those are things it doesn't do. So I talked about some of those earlier. Now, uh, our biggest challenge uh -huh. will be battling the biotech PR uh, assault. You know, you're going to see a lot. It's already started. Did, did yeah. anybody here get a telephone call from the Nelson Group a couple months ago? All right, the Farm Bureau is already hiring uh, PR firms to call people up and say, if you knew that GMOs would be blocking your kids in Africa and starve to death, would you vote yes for the initiative? And they're doing that. They're looking for the messaging and things like that. You're going to see an uh, onslaught of radio spots, TV spots, uh, uh, talking about uh, what's going on. But let me show you this picture here. I need to get into pointer mode. Who pays the pipe or pays the tune? This is the Oregon State Election Database about who spends what. This is the Oregon Farm Bureau on the right. 
And I took, I did, you know, for the last eight years, who's donated money to the Farm Bureau Political Action Committee? And look down the line here, who the top uh, contributors to the Farm Bureau are. You recognize some of these names? Okay, so when the Farm Bureau says we have 4,000 farmers in the state of Oregon. Read it. Oh, you can't read it? No. Oh, wait, let me focus it. It, okay, it's, it's Monsanto, 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 Syngenta, Syngenta, Syngenta. This, this is sorted in the descending uh, size of contribution. Now, this goes back five or six years in total, but if I every year, this like Monsanto is also, guess what? They like to play golf together. Nice schmoozy thing. They do it on a, uh, every year. This, this year will be the 10th annual uh, Oregon uh, Monsanto Farm Bureau Golf event. You can go online, you get an application, and go play golf with the big guys. But anyway, that's what you're up against. When the Farm Bureau says we have 4,000 members, 4,000 farmers, well, let me remind you this. Ash and Food Co-op, which stands behind us, they have 8,000 members alone. Oh, okay. Okay. Pays the piper, calls the tune on the opposition. Uh, and here's a list. Chris talked about that. Here is a list of 100 farms. You're not going to be able to read one. It's too small. That's 100 farms in Rogue Valley have signed a statement saying we support a ban on GMO crops. This is not so much a, I think we were called frothy zealots by a couple of uh, <laughs> newspapers in the area. And, uh, you know, some local politicians here think we're just a bunch of, you know, activists and stuff. There's 100 farms in this neighborhood that don't want this. And the list of businesses and organizations, as Chris mentioned, we have 400 people who signed that pledge. This is not a trivial list. Now, so we can uh, combating some of the GMO myths. Some of them already dealt with, like yields and uh, pesticides. I won't deal with all those. But let's talk about the top one. The release of GMOs is based on good science. You're going to hear that. Well, guess what, folks? Who's heard of something called the term substantial equivalence? Okay, who prop Okay, where does this substantial equivalence come from? It's the policy or uh, regulatory framework for regulating the release of GMOs. Substantial equivalence came out in 1992. Y'all remember Dan Quayle? The guy who spelled Cato really well, right? Okay, well, 1992, part of George Bush the first. Uh, regulatory relief policies was faced up against the fact in the early 90s GMOs were new, so we wanted to sell a lot of them. So they decided, well, you know, to, to cut down our regulations, we'll just use the concept of substantial equivalence. Well, where did that come from? There's a group called the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's an international trade association whose mission is to promote trade and sell things nothing to do with science, okay? So, you know, I talk about good science. No, it's not good science, it's no science. It's strictly a regulatory uh, con game, okay? They talk about these things that are generally regarded as safe, and who they rely on under substantial equivalence. The only people who have to verify that they're, quote, safe, okay, are the companies who produce the stuff. And they only have to do a 90-day study, and they're done, all right? Um, the USDA test for human health and safety, what are you worried about? Um, let me tell you, go to the internet, look at APHIS, uh, their charter. Their charter is plant safety. Does this new plant threaten the old plant as a weed or a noxious deal? They don't test for animal safety, they don't test for human safety, they don't test for economic impact, they don't care. It's not because they're like bad, it's just not in their charter, all right? Uh, oh, the GMO thinks GMO is totally safe, sort of. That's half true. Last June, the AMA said, well, you know, they're probably okay to eat. There's no real bad evidence. However, there are sufficient, this is right direct quote, there are sufficient risk factors that we're demanding mandatory pre-release testing. That's what the AMA said. Okay, this stuff is risky. So uh, that's another myth you're going to hear. And all this is kind of long. Uh, no one's gotten meal from the GMOs. Robin addressed that. Oh, counties that pass GMO bans, they're playing with lawsuits. Okay, who paid? Okay, in California, Mendocino and Marin County had both passed bans back in 2004. How many lawsuits have they had to face? Who say, folks? 
I called up the county uh, commissioners and the DA for both counties, and they both sent me certification. There were no lawsuits as a result of the county ban. So when you hear that from some of our county commissioners, tell them to take a watch because they're telling you a fib. Um, okay. So what about Marin County? <laughs> All right. I don't think you read some of this stuff. All right. In 2004, they passed their ban. Let's see. Get a pointer on here. Oop. Oh, I just did it. Let me go back to this slide fully. Sorry about that. Uh, slideshow. Where is it? Oh, full screen. You know, I'll just do this. It's uh, slideshow. Current slide. So in 2004, total ag production in Marin County was 59, 55 million bucks. Last year, it was 80 million bucks. And back in 2004, organic production was just under $4 million. Today, it's $28 million. And the number of organic producers eight years ago was 34. They more than doubled. They're 84. So if I index those things, make them all 100 back in 2004, and put an index on there for 2012, you can see that Total agriculture has gone up about 50%, but the number of producers has gone up double, and the value of that organic production has gone up seven times. Okay, So now, what's that, that's an important. Let's just think about Jackson County, and we could have a ban here. How big is agriculture in this county? It's about $79 million, right? And uh, if, we can, if we can just achieve half, half that uh, goal, 25% growth, That'd be about $18 million additional income. And if you look at a multiplier effect where a farmer gets a buck and spends a buck, a multiplier effect, I'm telling you, measure 15119, it could be at least worth $35 million a year to our economy. Now, that's something to think about. All right, so <laughs> I'll end with protect your food farms in the future, right to farm, right, not right to harm. But yes, do it for yourself, do it for your families. Thank you very much. Thank you once again to our panelists. We move on to the question and answer period. Dr. Miller, do you think there is a connection between the Hughes rides of diabetes and genetically modified foods? I, I really don't know. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, but um, I actually think the rise in diabetes has more to do with people being overweight, obese, and eating. Many carbs. And I watch yourself. <laughs> and that has your size. So I don't know if there's a connection between that and your Very good, thank you. Chris Hardy, can Syngenta grow their crops for seeds indoors, and how much would this protect against cross pollination? Uh, that would be somewhat challenging if you think of it, uh, plots across the Rogue Valley. One piece that I left out of presentation. Uh, uh, as the Syngenta Southern Oregon manager for sugar beet production told me, uh, virtually, you know, we talked about where our farm was, which is, you know, South End, Ashland area, Valview, and such. Um, and he said from coming out from Ashland, they're checkerboarded all the way out to, the, to, to, Rogue, uh, out to Rogue River and on into Grants Pass and up into the Applegate, you know, virtually everywhere. So, um, uh, these acreage, these plots are a quarter acre, four acre, possibly ten acre, uh, so uh, and any, anywhere in between. So if you think about what it would take to cover, to, to put a structure over that would be challenging. You know, I'm just trying to think right. Five acre greenhouse for one sugar field. You know, and, and they've got dozens of plots out all over the Rogue Valley checkerboard. So I'm just thinking massive, you know, I also know the nature of a greenhouse. Some of you pro probably have been in a greenhouse or two. Trying to button those things down to keep 
little bit of wind, you know, you open up the door and woof, this massive amount of pollen's all of a sudden released from, from several thousand uh, GM sugar beets inside a quarter acre massive greenhouse. Like, whoa, that, that's just like a bomb ready to go off. So I, I think that would be challenging at best. Thank you. Dr. Seidler, what monitoring is done to be sure the initial laboratory procedures are not contaminated when creating GMOs? Wow, good question. I have to tell you that these days, if the seed uh, is the same product that's been out in the field for 5, 10, 15 years, there's no, no monitoring required. No, none at all. Sorry. But actually, in the laboratory, when they're initially creating ah. things, how, who's ah. running the laboratory procedures and who's watching that to make sure the patient doesn't get in initially. Yeah, okay, good question. Uh, thank you. The laboratories where that kind of work uh, that you're alluding to, and I mean by that, the actual genetic manipulation uh, is typically done in a fairly well protected, fairly sealed laboratory and it is in no one's interest at that stage of development for anything to escape uh, because each company does not want anyone else to know what it is that they're developing. But, but who uh, is monitoring that? Is that it's all self-monitoring. There is yeah. no U.S. government, no state, no local county, city uh, involvement anywhere in the U.S. Thank you. Dr. Miller. Thank you for your thoughtful presentation. I, along with many others, suffer with allergies for the first time. I'm concerned that GMO, alfalfa, and other crops are molecularly different enough to cause allergies in people who have never had reactions before. Is this assumption backed by your medical knowledge of how allergens work as far as new, unprecedented exposures? Yes. Can we prove it? No. But definitely it's a possibility. But can we prove it? I Well, it would be to prove that it's actually the reason why you're having the allergic response. And so, like, aren't there allergy tests that doctors do? There and are. And an actual, a uh, regular alfalfa that we've grown up in, would it react on our skin? Well, it would be, it, it would be possible if you had an allergist that was willing to do that. <laughs> and if you could find the crop that you think is doing it to you, uh -huh. then it's possible. But you'd have to find someone willing to do that. Thank you. Chris or any other panelist, how can we discover which GE crops here are in the Rogue Valley? Is there a registry? Uh, so at this time we have genetically engineered sweet corn, field corn, alfalfa. So to, to be clear, uh, we believe that it's Roundup Ready uh, sweet corn. I don't. I haven't heard that it's BT sweet corn, but Roundup Ready sweet corn, Roundup Ready field corn, and then uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa and Roundup Ready sugar beets. So that's what we have being grown in the Rogue Valley at this time. It was as of last fall, 2012, uh, which was about uh, a little better than a year on uh, before the first of the Roundup Ready alfalfa crops hit the Rogue Valley. So. Um, if you think about that, that was about like, uh, by the way, alfalfa gets planted in the fall, so, you know, that was the window to get it planted round one. And it sounded like very few numbers of crops went in across Jackson, Josephine County. So we're, we're honestly, we're really early in the game here on this. So you don't hear a lot of despair about people like, oh, we're, it's too late, the GMO pollen and everything are all over the place. So the reality is that with sugar beets, that's, you know, this is like the beta revolution, some of the farmers are starting to call it this, because the beta is the GMO sugar beet, and that's really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to this multinational corporation who's here growing the beta vulgaris, which are the chard and the beet family that would enter, uh, you know, cross-pollinate. So that, that's really a, this whole GMO thing, why we're all sitting here in this room tonight is 
about the beta, the beta vulgaris that sugar beet. It's less about the corn and the alfalfa, but you know, as time continues to move on and the propaganda hits the streets, you know, people are being sold on this idea of higher yields, less weeds, uh, you know, uh, less water, you know, all this special bells and whistles on, the, on these seeds, these special seeds are there, so that's, that's just, we need to be aware of that. And to follow up on that one, I'm going to paraphrase this question. Uh, is wheat, the Mail Tribune apparently uh, has stated that wheat is not GMO, and the follow-up question, are there tr fruit trees that are GMO? Either here or yonder. Well, there's no commercially grown genetically modified wheat. Primary, here in Oregon, 90% of the wheat that's grown here is exported. Japan, South Korea, places like that. They don't want it, they test for it, and that was one of the hassles about this discovery of this uh, volunteer wheat plants in this guy's field. Uh, and so they don't want, the wheat growers here today don't want it because the people they sell wheat to won't buy it. So, and, there's, and as a result, that was one of the reasons why that test wheat was withdrawn from market was due to market pressures. Um, uh, the second part of your question was? Fruit trees. Fruit trees. Well, well, there are, I'm not aware of them. Uh, fruit trees, stone fruits and things like that are generally grow through propagation. All right? I mean, if, they, if there are GM trees and the pollen gets in your fruit, the seed in the fruit will be GM, but the flesh around is grown, grown by the parent plant. And, and again, they don't, you usually don't grow pear trees from seed. All right, now what you don't know, I showed you that map of 664 test plots. You can look up what species are being given permits for, but they do not tell you where they are. All right, and they, you know, and they'll say, well, they're in Oregon. Well, which county? Can't tell you that. Well, what part of, you know, the, the, the USD permits for proprietary confidentiality reasons do not reveal the exact locations of the fields themselves. We have. In fact, had to discover them by bumping into the subjective people. They admitted to where they were. Right. It's a secret, and they're not labeled. And when the uh, USDA this investigator came up and talked to uh, Abilene Farms, everybody bought their food in the farmers market. <coughs> uh, there was a sugar beet field across from them. When the USDA investigator came out, he asked her, "Is this a beet farm?" Sorry, sir, can't comment. So, you know. but yeah, in general, fruit trees I think are grown through. There's a GMO apple in Canada that they're trying to sell, and, uh, and, and the apple growers here are fighting it big time. Uh, they don't want it, uh, mostly for market reasons, not some other reasons. But they're because they, they want to take out get baby carrots and they grind them up and they, they put them in a bag and they, they're tasteless, they're flavorless, but they're carrots and they're convenient. Well, they want to sell apples the same way: you slice them up, put them in a bag, and they never turn brown. Uh, that's that, that, that Canada is trying to push those on the apple market. For both Dr. Seidler and Dr. Miller, you stated that we know it, we just can't prove it. How do you overcome the words of the naysayers that say, well, if you can't prove it, you can't know it? What is it that we want to prove? That, that, GMO, that GMO is responsible for the ills that Dr. Miller has put out. I'm going to let Dr. Miller talk about the health effects side. How many colleges? I think we, what we have, all have to do is put pressure on those companies so that the human studies can be done. Um, and sooner or later, the, I mean, things are going to happen and it's going to definitely put pressure on them to do the studies that they're doing. The only thing I'd add is we better damn well do it soon because as it's repeatedly said, uh, the horses are well out of the barn on 200 million or so acres worldwide. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about, say, release of chemicals that dilute out or decompose. We're talking about living organisms that we now know go through multiple cycles of cross-pollination or reproduction and gene spread into who knows what, we need to find out soon. Okay. <coughs> Personal follow-up to that question, what do you anticipate would be the costs
to Monsanto, Syngenta, the other GM organizations, if they were to take on medical testing, if they were to take on the scientific testing, would that be so big that it would be a an economic disincentive and they would not do it at all? Where I come from, uh, uh, in my statement, I mean, where I come from uh, philosophically, uh, I truly believe that that should be a taxpayer-funded series of studies so that there is little to no chance of conflict of interest. Here's a specific question. How can Bob Kraus, Bob Kraus of Fort Benoit Farms and Grants Pass get GMO corn and organics side by side? So, certified organic, so he does certified organic seed, certified organic sweet corn, and genetically engineered Roundup resistant field corn. And he has nearly a hundred acres of, of uh, that field corn, no, yeah, and about 15 to 20 acres of certified organic corn production. So how is he able to do side by side? Um, because that corn that would share the pollen with the GMO variety and then make uh, corn is not expressing those proteins that you would understand those to be the Roundup resistant or pesticide producing DT. Is that correct, Ray? But rather, if you were to keep the corn and then let that dry down and let that that germ uh, ready itself for the next generation, let's say, you could then take that corn on uh, to plant and actually the progeny from that uh, generation would express those traits, those patented traits that, that you know, that, you're, you're want, that Bob would, would want to avoid if he was again selling that corn as certified organic as, as I know he is doing. So, so that's how he's able to... By not propagating the seeds as seeds, by propagating the plant as foodstones, is what you're saying? Yes, before okay. it becomes the next generation. Yes. Because it's, you know, half right. the male and half the female come together to make the next generation. One is GM, one is not. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, one's the pollen and one's the, the seed. So that's, it, it's not quite gotten to the next chance to make another life yet of GM. Right. He's also in, in control of all his own logistics. I, he knows what's planted where, when they bloom, when they don't bloom, things like that. Now, in that scenario, he may have some control to be able to manage it. In, a, in, a, in an open market area, though, where you've got all these different neighbors doing things and not talking to each other, all right, there's no guarantee that you're not going to be able to do it side by side. And then that, that coexistence model with the seed association was designed to get some group control over, okay, I'm going to plant here, you're going to plant there, I'm going to plant this week, you're going to plant next week, kinds of things. And if that model falls apart, it's back to every man for himself or every woman for himself or herself. And um, so, you know, that's part, part of the model there. Is he may be able to manage it himself, but in a group situation, it would be tough to do. Yeah, he better have good communication with his neighbors all the way through and know exactly who's growing, if he's going to be transparent and open about it. The chance that someone else the downwind effect. Yeah. May, may, uh, uh, yes. I'm going to sort of say this as a statement and a question for the panelists. It's my understanding that the USDA has, in recent years, changed the definition of certifiable organic, uh, of certifiable uh, foodstuffs, uh, and is now allowing up to one percent GMO contamination. Oh. It's, 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 it's a work in progress. Um, they, uh, so the National Organic Program, the Organ National Organic Standards Board met to discuss the NOP rules which oversee the organ, or, organ tilt. So National Organic Program is the rule for organic food. It is how you do business. It's how you make your compost. It's, you know, what's your timing and your record keeping and your, you know, 
the certifier comes out and he's like walking, the inspector comes out and walks the whole property, you better have your I's dotted and your T's crossed. That's what the NOP is. And that all is dictated, that USDA is the NOP. The NOP then uh, shares their uh, rules with Oregon Tilth, with California Certified Organic, with ODA, with Washington State Tilth, uh, or, or Maine Organic Farmers Association. That, that, that is the NOP, gives them all the rules of what they need to follow. At this time, there's just this heavy duty wake up call. They, you know, thrown the whole uh, beta, you know, the sugar beets, they've deregulated the alfalfa a year and a half, two, virtually two years ago, they deregulated. Again, it's just starting to make its way out into the mainstream to where, you know, our dairy cows are getting fed the GM alfalfa. And, and in the meantime, there's a seed grower right next door so that the alfalfa could possibly be getting contaminated. It's a, it's a perennial. It lives and lives and lives, you know, so every year it's blowing its GMO pollen. So, you know, people are like, man, I don't want that GMO stuff. I want my organic stuff. And so people are, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to this point where there's a fork in the road and you're either getting stronger on this side or stronger on this side. So people are like, farmers are saying, I don't want that stuff. And so, the, you know, the, the overseer of this, the USDA National Organic Program, which is basically led by the National, uh, by the, uh, the NOSB, the Na National Organic Standards Board, which is a board of basically like bigger corporations like Whole Foods that are making up these rules. And then all these other regions have to play by that uh, organic rule. And so if they say we 1% is what we, 2%, uh, you know, you even hear numbers of up to 4%, 5% being discussed. So it might end up being 2%, 3%, who knows where they're going to put, basically put the, you know, raise the bar, lower the bar, where it's going to end up. And, you know, it's case in point, you know, I could have just kept my mouth shut with our, our uh, beta seeds, with our, our charred seeds that we had, con were contracted to grow. So those seeds would have just gone on to be put into packets in Maine and then shipped right back here, incidentally, to the Rogue Valley to be sold to all of us down at the Grange Co-ops, and if any of you shop, you know, you'll probably find a territorial, packet of ter ter territorial seed. Like, that could have been our farm, village farm, growing those and keeping our mouths shut because, yeah, you know, like, I'm not certain where those GMOs are, but here's our seeds because we need that thousand dollars. And just send them on. And does anybody require testing? No. But, again, that is going to be changing here soon because this is just the whole wake-up call for a lot of our, our nation here, for our farmers and for our seed quality. Thank you. Brian. Yep, real, uh, real quick comment. Some of those percentage numbers are also an upstream production of the, uh, the products. When an organic cookie maker gets buys flour to make cookies, he buys it from a flour distributor who got wheat from 25 or 30 providers, and we know one of those one of those uh, trucks came in that it carried GMO week the week before and uh, organic week the week after. Uh, you know, so, so, so some of that, those percentages are basically, if you're an organic cookie maker, what percentage of your flour can uh, have uh, GMO wheat in it? So I mean, you have to look at the, what, what the number's for. They know, now, that's not to say that organic standards aren't under assault. All large corporations would love to change the definition so they, because it's, it's profitable. General Mills and uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, anyway, General Foods, these people want to sell because they make more money, and so they, they like to relax their standards. But uh, so just keep that in mind when you hear those numbers. It's uh, it maybe the upstream uh, collection points. Great, thank you. Let me just say one quick thing. Yes. You said farmers don't want the GMO seed. Well, animals don't want it either. Right. When given the choice of GMO feed versus non-GMO feed, they will go to the non-GMO feed and ignore the GMO feed. Yeah. So, what is that telling you? Intelligent animals. Very smart. <laughs> Sorry. Alrighty. Uh, question about the Rogue Valley Seed Growers Association. Can you give us a you know, public service announcement on that, please? Yes. Yeah, so Who are they? What do they do? The, uh, the Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association, SASCA. Um, uh, bylaws again just approved a couple days ago, so we're moving forward with that. Uh, shooting for a 501 uh, C5, and that's gonna 
Uh, that's going to basically uh, be it for our local uh, seed production. The door is open and has and it continues to be open to Syngenta Corporation because we, as the 40 plus farmers that came together, including Syngenta, decided to choose that route. That we were not going to create an exclusive organization and make it something of a political thing, but rather we would be open to anybody being at the table. So uh, uh, as far as like the, the, the purpose of the organization, it is there to support uh, small, diversified uh, farming um, to ensure seed quality so that we as uh, you know, see, moving into the seed world, which there's huge opportunities for farmers, if any of you are farmers in the room, uh, for, for another source of income besides just growing the vegetative, that you take down you know, your bunch of beets at the farmer's market and sell for $2 a bunch. You know, those, that bunch of four or five beets at a quarter of a pound of seeds per, you know, all of a sudden, those, those four beets, you, you got a pound of seed. And that pound of seed is worth $30, $40, right? And if it's certified organic, you know, it, it could be worth more. And if you're selling those seeds direct to your customers, it could be worth $100. It could be worth a couple of hundred dollars. You know, whereas if you're contracted, it's it's kind of a lump sum that you're just like growing all these seeds, seeds so you get paid less. So anyhow, huge economic incentive for more of our farmers to pick up this uh, craft, this skill that has been lost through time to really uh, uh, see another way to get economic uh, incentive and income under our farmers while they're feeding our community are also growing seeds for their farm. They're growing seeds for other farms, trading those seeds with other farms. So uh, this, this seed association has a, a lot of layers of functionality that are really gonna help us out moving forward here with this. Follow-up question to that, is the Rogue Valley a special place when it comes to seed production, much like the Willamette Valley, uh, Willamette Valley and if so, why? Uh, yes, indeed. The Willamette Valley is in the top four uh, in the world for seed production capacity. And the Rogue Valley is actually probably fifth or sixth or seventh or somewhere in there and the, re and the reason because we're not right up there with the Willamette Valley is because we are no, uh, no not nothing like the scale that they do up in the Willamette for one so this is by volume they are a 50 million dollar uh, outfit the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association so uh, the Rogue Valley I would say anybody know Eugene like are we drier or wetter than the Eugene quarters? <laughs> Dry, right? And so what makes really good seed quality, seed production, is the aridity of our climate. So this is like, you know, once you sit with that for a little bit and figure out like, okay, betas, uh, the, the chard and the beet family, love the climate down here in Southern Oregon. Alliums, all the leeks and onions and uh, uh, garlic production, our soils are set up for all these alliums. So this is a huge opportunity to grow these because our climate is set up and many, many more uh, uh, of these seed crops uh, prefer the, the, the uh, hot and dry going all the way into the fall. So it's a huge opportunity for us. Thank you. Uh, to the panel at large, what steps do we take if 633 passes or if 15119 fails? How do we directly claim our right to a healthy food supply? Odds are real good that Senate Bill 633, which but we don't know, has a bill that was introduced uh, by our uh, local politician, Mr. Esquivel, here, and uh, Senator Baird trigger grants pass, which would preclude or prevent our initiative from even going to the ballot. It said that, that the state had exclusive jurisdiction over seed matters. That bill passed the Senate on a 17, maybe. 15 vote or something like that, and uh, went to the House. And Peter Bucky, bless his heart, our local representative, got to the Rules Committee and they buried it. It's probably not going to come up for air this year. However, not a deal. Don't pass the chicken to sell their hatch because there's some, there's some things going on or they may pop back up. Uh, some horse trading at the end. And the bad news is, is this is a zombie. It'll keep coming back no matter how many times you shoot it. So uh, it may be back in February 2014. 
and it'll probably be back in a tooth. It was the, 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 the big act that people are not going to go away. Now, well, they told us when the SB 633 was uh, in, in play that the, the by far and away the loudest, largest email and phone response of the whole session, exponentially larger, was opposition to Senate Bill 633. So yeah. it's an ongoing struggle. Uh, I can't guarantee it. Now, if 15119's got to pass, well, we'll see. It's going to be a tough struggle. All right. Um, we got to do it. We can do it. You're going to all help us do it. Yes. And uh, uh, so I, did I get your question answered? Vote with our dollars. Well, I, uh, well, I'll we'll say that. That's a wonderful we'll segue. We have donation there. envelopes in the back, folks. <laughs> And please, please, and if you, if you know, you can give us 50 bucks and it won't cost you a penny. If you pay Oregon's income tax, and most of you do, Oregon allows you to deduct a $50 tax credit, not deduction, a credit. You take 50 bucks off your taxes and give it to GMO Free Jackson County. It's a little trick that a lot of people don't know about. So you can give us 50 bucks each, $500 we file jointly. And you can do it and it won't cost you yeah. a penny. So please, please, go to our website, hit the donate button, or grab an envelope. Thank you. Thank you. For the doctors, has there been any tests in countries that have banned GMOs as to the rates of allergies or other illnesses as compared to statistics in the United States? Well, they did do it in England. It's banned in Europe. And the reason is because they suspected that allergies were a real issue. Um, other countries, I don't know if they've done any discrete studies, but I know the one in England was pretty dramatic, where the allergies went up from 10 to 15 percent in one year mm -hmm. from genetically modified soy. Mm -hmm. That's pretty profound. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the reasons uh, other than we wanted to, but there are about 60 countries in the world that have completely banned uh, growing all GMO products. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the last question I'll ask this evening, is your organization trying to pursue legal action against Syngenta for the contamination you are seeing? Yeah, GMO Free Jackson County is not, not into that business. We're in the business of uh, banning GMOs in, from Jackson County. Uh, in the ballot box. In the ballot box, May 2014, for sure. So as far as our farm uh, pursuing legal action, that is not something that, um, that we are interested to do because that is, uh, this kind of seems to be like a full-time job of litigating and going after the monster. David and Goliath, and uh, I have a friend, uh, farmer Jim Gerritsen, that is the president of the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association, and they've led a fight here of 300,000 farmers across the United States uh, to uh, basically have a preemptive, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, what's that? injunction uh, to, to keep Monsanto from suing any of these farmers in the event that say like Bob Cross's uh, sweet corn, uh, uh, you know, whatever contaminates or his uh, GMO uh, field corn contaminates another farmer's uh, sweet corn that's organic, uh, that Monsanto's technology, Monsanto would not come after that neighbor that says that you got our technology. And they lost citing the judge, the Supreme Court, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court uh, said that there is no proof that Monsanto has that practice. They do not just wait for, for this to happen and then go after anybody, any organic farmers. And that there, that there was just not a precedent uh, that, that and, and indeed we, we know the case because there are virtually hundreds of cases across the United States uh, and upwards of 85 million to 160 something million Center for Food Safety reports. Uh, that have been lit uh, not outside of court, not litigated, but just payments made to Monsanto, because like, oh, sorry, just stepping on your toes there, you know, and that, that's coming from hundreds of farmers across the United States. So, like here in the Rogue Valley, we have this chilling effect. Uh, Brian mentioned Glenda, Glenda and Tom Ponder, they just kind of stopped growing chard seed. I know of many farmers in the Rogue Valley who don't grow beet seeds, or don't grow chard seeds anymore because 
are just, it's just not worth it knowing, you know, to have it sent off, to have it tested, to, you know, Monsanto, somebody, Syngenta is going to come after you. It's, heck, we'll just go on the internet and buy these seeds. So that's, you know, that's the chilling effect that are really not productive for our local, supporting our local farmers. Reactions are taking place. Uh, Senator Clown uh, of the uh, Oregon Legislature sent a letter to the Attorney General of the state demanding that the Attorney General look into getting damages to our wheat growers here. We're talking about losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, I didn't do it for the uh, organic farmers in Rogue Valley, but uh, that's one thing that's being done uh, at the state level, as well as there are two now class action lawsuits have been filed, one by a Center for Food Safety and one by a private individual class action suits against Monsanto about the wheat release in uh, Oregon and the potential damages there. So um, so those are the only two, le those are legal actions I know taking place where they're going after Monsanto for the, because it was, it was shown it was a Monsanto stream that was found in the, uh, on the, in the Oregon field. That concludes our forum for this evening. Dr. Ray Seidler, Dr. Robin Miller, Chris Hardy, and Brian Holmes, thank you for bringing us here. I'm sure they will stick around for autographs and a photo session. <laughs> <laughs>